Right, well, hello, everyone. We are going to get the lightning talk started. I have some of my lightning talkers, and I will round them up going along. The first lightning talks we have for you uh, will be from Alex and Valerio. They're going to be giving a shout out to EuroPython and EuroSciPy and telling you all about that coming up. And of course, there'll be after, at the end of the, the lightning talk, um, if you yourself are running a meetup or a conference series and you are restarting uh, now that the, the world is returning to a new normal, uh, then you are very welcome uh, to stand up and announce your meetup uh, and your community that you are trying to start. Right, without further ado, chaps, you have five minutes. So All right. uh, the oh, floor five is yours. Minutes. That's friendly. Big clap. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. So the first lightning talk. So we just want to introduce you a little bit to Southwest Germany. That's PyData Southwest. That's Southwest Germany. So we're here. It's a combination of uh, three, soon four cities. Uh, we've gathered one meetup here. And this is basically how the community there looks like. And uh, yeah, and we have this one event uh, I want to tell you about. Uh, but remember, we are in Southwest Germany. Um, you know, and then Focus is in Austin, Texas. Yeah, keep that in mind. So this is how we imagine Texas in Germany. And if you Google Austin, actually, it seems to look more like this. So um, last year, we uh, planned uh, um, uh, our next event. Uh, so I was talking to Jim, say, hey, we're going to go back and have the new meetup, and you should know about Texas and Austin, they are really proud of barbecue. So basically, Texas ribs, barbecue, everything's Texas barbecue. And I said, hey, Jim, we have this new, uh, the, the meat of the big data barbecue is coming back again. And then Jim just said, oh, big data barbecue, that's awesome. Why didn't he come up with this here in Texas? So actually, the claim now is a big data barbecue uh, is actually made in Germany, and we have to bring it back to Texas again. <laughs> that said, um, I'm really happy to announce um, the next big bar, beta barbecue with pie ladies, all female speakers, just coming 7th of July. So if you're in the area, if you're around, if you're friends, please have them come by. We're really happy. Uh, it's like 200 people, barbecue, cool talks, networking, and talking about um, food. Of course, it's barbecue, but we also have vegetable options, like veggie options. So, uh, of course, it includes basil and vernario. Yeah, so talking about basil, how about having a conference in Basel, this time in Switzerland? Um, that was a good joke, I told you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I don't deserve claps for this. But yeah, so um, we're going to have you, SciPy, back again um, uh, after, after two years of stop. Uh, it's going to be in Switzerland. Uh, we had the call for proposal open, unfortunately, it's closed now, so it was open. Um, and it's going to be end of August. 29th of August, 2nd of September this year. Location is Switzerland again. Uh, we're going to have a, a kind of a hybrid conference in person and remote if you can't attend it. Uh, we're going to have uh, tutorials and so the structure of Eurosupply, we're going to have two, uh, two days of uh, tutorials, two days of talks, and the last day is sprints for open source projects. This is the uh, usual structure of USIPI. It's about uh, you, Python and science. Well, you can you can find very very I'm I'm sure lots of contribution from from this audience. Uh, ticket sites will be open soon, presumably in one week. It's just like a matter of fixing things with the Swiss government. Uh, please check out the website USIPI.org/2022 or Twitter at USIPI. And I go oh, hand it back to Alex. Oh, thanks. Oh, so we started with a quiz. So, oh, yeah, so now I get James' attention. Um, what have the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the Jill, killer robots, and AI dystopia in common? Three, two, one. Oh, the solution is actually Europe Python, because we have great keynotes about everything. So we have Patrick here. He's working on a James Webb Space Telescope, and he's going to give a keynote just one day after NASA will release the first pictures from this new space telescope, which is basically the replacement for Hubble. So we're really excited. Laura from Slack, she will talk about uh, killer robots and her work at Google. And I'm also like super thrilled that, um, Sam Gross from Facebook AI will come about because actually he removed the Jill um, in a fork. And this is like really changing thing for Python in the future, really, the, because many people tried this before. And we have Nakima, and she will also talk about AI dystopia and her work at, at Found Loop. So your Python is close by. Um, it's in Dublin, it's uh, in, in, in July. Um, we're really happy uh, if you want to come by. Programs up, ticket sales up, just visit the website, check out the program. We also have a great PyData talk, and I have one more minute, and I have nothing left to say. Oh, there you go. 
Yeah, but. So, yeah. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you do a lightning talk. If you leave yourself 50 seconds at the end, that's good. We appreciate it. Right, this is our small little impromptu segment. Uh, does anyone here organise a meetup or a conference or things like that and they'd like to tell everyone in the room that they're doing it? I see a hand at the back. There we go, we planted a stooge. Uh, that is, of course, John, uh, co organiser of the conference. So, yes, the Pied at London meetup has restarted. It will be, oh, excellent. Uh, Adam. Lovely, so that's Pi Data Southampton. Fantastic. Anyone else who would like to get excellent one? Pi Data Madrid just restarted when Omicron um, died off, basically. And we're having our next meetup on Thursday. So if you happen to be around Madrid, please come. Lovely, there we go. Fantastic. Right. Anybody else? Jo John, you can't go again, mate. There's one, another one over there. Good. Oh, is that a hand? One. Sorry, there's a hand over here. Lovely stuff. And is that something they can find on meetup.com or something like yeah, that? Bath Machine Learning Meetup. Bath Machine Learning Meetup. Fantastic. If you're in the ancient city of Aquasulis, you can, of course, go along to a machine learning meetup. Fantastic. Right. Jim? Say, if uh, you heard Alexander talk about Austin Barbecue and thought that sounds pretty good, uh, October 27, 28, we're doing a Python at Scale conference in Austin, Texas. Ooh. There we go. So lots of events suddenly coming out of the woodwork. It's good, isn't it? Right. Dina, your next mate. So we're going to have our next lightning talk speaker. So, Dean is going to talk on just data, Dean. Oh, data marketplaces. It just says data. <laughs> Did it? That's really broad, mate. You've got five minutes. <laughs> How do I switch it? <laughs> hey. Off you go. Hey. First round of applause. Hey, I'm going to talk, talk about data marketplaces, right? So, you know, in theory, data is, you know, everyone talks about acquiring data sets, but in practice, you know, it's really hard to find data sets to buy uh, or samples. Uh, once you sort of even identify data sets which are for sale, then sort of speaking to a broker, sales team, getting, getting it credentialed, uh, large data vendors won't sort of just allow you to use your credit cards and buy data, so it's pretty hard to do it in practice. And once you have access to a data set, then you have to wait for your IT team to ETL it across. Uh, and, and then eventually you can end up using it. And once you sort of even set up a pipeline, every update you know, follows the same cycle or a reduced cycle. Again, if you're a data producer or you have valuable data assets, it's pretty hard for a small company to monetize it, its assets. Right? You, it's not easy to list it. If, even if you list it, it's hard to sort of spend uh, in, yeah, money on IT infrastructure to sort of publish data sets. So this, this was the state of the art in data sharing, right? A lot of existing yeah, data producers or you know, data companies like uh, market data providers do this, right? So, so they extract data from their data warehouses or data lakes, put it out onto F SFTP sites. When you have large data sets, you have to chunk it up. Uh, and then there's a huge process on the other side which does it in reverse. And it takes months, especially if you have large data sets. And this is pretty expensive, right? So SFTP servers uh, use expensive disk, have to be kept running 24-7. Uh, so that's the state of the art. It takes months, it's pretty expensive, and it's hard to sort of do it at scale. 
So things are pretty much cha changing with data marketplaces, right? So this thing's going away, and it's been sort of uh, a lot of cloud vendors allow you to sort of publish data to your shared buckets, and uh, instantly uh, access is given to the consumer buckets in an instant. So what's changing from SFTP is all these data exchanges allow you to sort of put data in the cloud, and they just provision access to each of your consumers. Uh, and along with it, it comes with cataloging uh, tools to provision access, and your consumers can run workloads immediately. This is a view of what Snowflake does. So effectively, if you publish to your Snowflake account, all your consumers get access to data instantly. But pretty much, there are most, other, most of the cloud vendors have something similar. And most exchanges would have these features out of the box, right? So you can have a catalog where you can list your assets for sale, you have samples, you have documentation, uh, you have scalable storage, which is pretty cheap. Uh, you, you don't need servers running 24 seven, and you just have one copy of data. Uh, you have an entitlements uh, system, which allows you to sort of entitle only people who have bought data. Uh, you have some exchanges also sort of manage billing and fulfillment for you. And then your clients or consumers can run analytics in place. So with Snowflake or AWS, the moment you publish data, it comes in all your consumers' S3 buckets or their databases. And pretty much within seconds, you, the, the analysts can run it in place. So yeah, so these exchanges allow you to allow publishers to sort of publish data and sell it effectively, reach more customers because you have it listed in the catalog. Uh, and it's valuable to customers pay more because they have zero ETL cost uh, on their side. Uh, and you get rid of a lot of IT and fulfillment teams uh, that, that are currently involved in monetizing things. A cool feature with these assets is that you can actually have views on assets, right? So you can sort of join or filter data sets and limit what you publish or customize it as well per customer. In addition, you know, it's a cheap way of, even if you are not selling data within organizations, it's a cheap way of building a data mesh because it comes with a catalog. You can share assets across business lines. Uh, and you don't need to sort of spend a lot of time or infrastructure building a data mesh. It's like a ready-made data mesh uh, where a lot of data lakes are moving to. So that's all I had. Very well done, Didi. You had 12 seconds left on the clock. Perfect. Thank you very much for that and data and marketplaces. Our next lighting speaker, Arturo. Is there an Arturo? Yes, yes mates. If you want to come and do you have, you got a memory stick? Good, right, who's got a laptop? Uh, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Julie, can I borrow a laptop? Cheers, mate. Yes, please. Lovely, and Arturo is going to talk about scikit-learn MOOC. Now let's see if I can do my acronyms. Massive, uh, where is it? online, please? nope. Uh, nope. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's not got one of these. Thing, I think. Maybe, yeah, we don't know how that door. That should work. <laughs> Is it being recognized? Or? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think. Uh, 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 check this one. There you are. Perfect. All right, Arturo. Five minutes is yours. Big round of applause, everyone. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to use this to set the full screen window, probably. Uh, View. Let's say view into full screen. Yeah, sure. Or slideshow. Perfect. 
Okay, anyway, I'm going to be relatively brief. Um, so I'm here to present you the MOOC Machine Learning in Python, in Python with Scikit-Learn. MOOC stands for Multi Open Online Course, oh. which is, yeah, <laughs> open. <laughs> uh, and yes, uh, uh, this is uh, a, a work in, uh, in collaboration with both the core developers of Scikit-Learn, or at least a subset of us, uh, INRIA, in particular INRIA Learning, Learning Lab, which is a French institution, uh, and also the France Numeric, uh, Université Numérique, which is uh, the platform we are using to have the, the quizzes uh, running for getting a scores and certificate, but I'm going to get in more into details right now. So as I was saying, uh, we have a forum, and it's moderated by some of the core developers of Scikit-Learn. So we, it's a very active forum, uh, very friendly, and it usually goes beyond the material that it's covering the course. So I strongly recommend taking this course just because of the first bullet point. So uh, it's also very useful for uh, people who are starting to get uh, involved with machine learning because you have nothing to install. Uh, you also get free certification. Uh, and something that really makes us different from everybody else, else is that uh, we are open source, which means you can uh, literally contribute to, to the course. So if you see some of the content which is not very well explained or that you think that it can be improved, uh, you can uh, send a PR and uh, we will take it into account. Uh, you can also take a look at the issues in our GitHub, uh, which is uh, that one in the bottom. Um, and make some comments or address some issues. Uh, and we also have uh, this static version of the MOOC, which is, which is open and available all the time. And uh, you can, uh, I mean, I, we have a screenshot here, uh, which corresponds to the, to the static version in the Jupyter book. But as I was saying, we also have the, the fun version, which is not running, running in the moment, but uh, is the one that uh, allows for certification. So uh, our philosophy is to have the hands-on, um, like uh, coding and beyond answering just uh, questions and uh, a good uh, mix between the concepts and actual work. So we have 15 video lessons, 70 programming notebooks, 21 exercises which are not graded. Uh, so it's really a lot of work. So it's uh, supposed to be achievable in seven weeks, but everybody can do it on their own pace. Uh, we, are, we are usually open for uh, periods of two months. So far we have had uh, two sessions, one last year and uh, one this year uh, from um, February to May. And we are planning to have a third session on the fall of this year, probably October and November. We still don't have a fixed date. So. Um, yeah, the structure of the course is like this. It really goes uh, step by step uh, you know, to introduce people into machine learning. And uh, it's not the usual structure that a MOOC uh, may have because we want people to really get to make a model, a, a very simple model from the very first notebook. So you, you get a, a taste of a data set and then you start cutting simple stuff. Also, it's really good when you are trying to understand how the scikit-learn library works, because from the very first uh, module, you uh, get to build a pipeline and uh, uh, understand how to uh, join different processes, for instance, pre-processing of uh, categorical versus numerical variables, and then uh, how to ensemble this uh, in, a, in a pipeline. Perfect. Um, at the end, uh, we, we have uh, a bunch of positive comments, so it's not only me who thinks that the, the MOOC is very well done. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of friendly users in, in general in, in our community, and most of the people are, are really uh, interested in going beyond, and in fact, in the conclusion model, we give some tips on how to contribute and how to go beyond uh, the contents of the MOOC. So many thanks, this is the team, this is the subset of uh, core developers that are working uh, uh, in the project, and uh, the technical, well, the technical part of, uh, of the pedagogical team. 
So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. Right, thank you very much. So our next one, if I can have the stage, Larry. I saw him earlier. Larry Dong. Here we are. Hello, mates. Right, he's got a laptop, so this one comes off. That's yours. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Right, and Larry is going to talk on the value of an open source community to a PhD student. How many PhD, ex-PhD students do we have in the room? There we go. You're in good company, my friend. Oh, that's We're, great. There's a bunch of us who've done it. Lovely. Uh, are you all ready, Larry? Screen? I'm... Okay. No? I'm plugged in. Oh, wait a second. No, that's the power cable. Ah, oh, whoops. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll uh, plug that's in. Right. I mean, they a, all have the same better. port nowadays. Oh, right, it's your favorite port. port. Yeah, well, it's, it's a better one, I think. I got maybe some cookie crumbs stuck in there. Okay, one moment. There we are. Five minutes. Big round of applause. All right, so thanks everyone for having me. Um, my name is Larry. I'm a second year PhD student in biostatistics at the University of Toronto, all the way from Canada. Um, and you can hear some of my social media links for a bit of advertisement, but you can also read more about my experience on, on my website. Um, so I'd like to start off the talk by sharing a little bit about <laughs> the Burnside analogy. So during my bachelor's and master's, I primarily studied in a building called Burnside. And it kind of looks like a Minecraft dungeon, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's not so appealing, but inside there was a very vibrant community. I started my PhD in September 2020, the height of the global pandemic as we all know, and uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was quite tough. Like, let's not sugarcoat it. But this unique experience has showed something, I guess, something very interesting is that, well, it was a bit lonely because we lacked in-person communication, but there was an environment that thrived in an online format. Right, we're at PyData, so it is open source. So my journey to open source was, I guess, sort of unexpected as I entered the PhD program, right? I was entering a PhD program. I was gonna do research, I guess, but maybe a little bit of history here. So I started using PyMC3 back in February 2019. So PyMC now is a probabilistic programming framework. Chris gave a very nice tutorial yesterday, and this can warrant a, another full hour and a half. Uh, and in July 2020, there was a summer school on Dirichlet processes. So Dirichlet processes can also warrant a few weeks, of course. Um, and it's a family of non-parametric methods for the estimation of density. So I won't get into that uh, in, in detail, but it's also a work in progress. When I started my PhD, there was a bit of interest in knowing what Bayesian package I should use. Well, now I answered my own question. Um, but it really only started in April 2021, when there was a tweet for GSOC. GSOC is Google Summer of Code, and it was a really nice um, springboard into contributing to open source. And my project was to implement a submodule for Dirichlet processes. Once again, I can warrant of much more conversation about this, but all I want to say is until now, um, I'm still contributing to PyMC. There was, we had a major version bump, and I was trying to help out as much as I could, and trying to dive deeper, dive deeper into its back end. And I guess the summary of the talk today would, um, if, would be twofold, I guess, for PhD students or just students in general and to open source maintainers. So I guess the first question is, like, why, why, why as students should we get involved? And because at the end of the day for a PhD, we want to write a 100-page plus dissertation, and that's why we want to graduate. Um, but there's a few, I guess, appealing uh, aspects of going, getting involved in open source. First of all, you can learn very well, in my opinion. There's a lot of these things that, for me, was a steep learning curve in the beginning, learning how to just Git, use Git, branching, pull requests, issues and whatnot, object-oriented programming, unit testing for me, probabilistic programming, and to get to know the whole ecosystem of tools that are already available was something that was very appealing. And there are tangible goals, and you can gain a lot of momentum and to learn via small issues. I think in graduate studies, research inherently is very difficult, progress can seem slow, but these issues can be very motivating, and, uh, and once again, you can have a lot of learning. And I think another two um, more appealing um, aspects, there's a nice network of professionals outside of academia. For myself, I've been studying, I guess, quite a lot uh, in the past few years, but to get to know people who have been through the same shoes, and we have a few hands raised, people who've been through a PhD 
um, program, there's a nice network of people that you can maybe connect with that are, well, won't say that you should do research for the rest of your life. And, uh, and yeah, open source opens doors and, and uh, allows you to have access to a lot of these communities that are very welcoming, like the one I'm, I'm part of, I'm very, I'm very grateful. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it is also a very attractive in the sense that it is a stepping stone into software development, which is uh, very financially, uh, financially appealing uh, skill to have. <laughs> uh, <less. laughs> and uh, if, I, if I had to encapsulate all this into a single, um, in single message for students, PhD students, masters, or whatever you're studying, don't be shy, you know? The, we do have a lot of communities online available who are ready to, to welcome you and uh, find a project that, you, uh, that you're passionate in and ask questions, you know? A lot of people are re ready to help for PyMC. We have a discourse and we're always trying to engage with new users and experienced users and whatnot. Lastly, um, to open source maintainers, if I had just maybe a few things to, to share with you, your project can positively impact students. I've, my focus right of this talk is, I guess, my experience, but just students in general. And your community can bring students together people who are looking for professional and personal development. You know, at the end of the day, our studies, our, the, our challenges can be inherently similar, and uh, you, you, might, you may have a lot more to offer to students more than, more than you think. And, uh, and graduate students, of course, or students in general, well, we, our studies will come to an end at some point, right? So we'll be looking for jobs. That's it. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you very much, Larry. And of course, best of luck defending your Viva. It's a terrifying experience. Um, <laughs> there's no other way of putting it. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, right, uh, Juan Mark Alkizi. Nope, two ones. This one. <laughs> um, oh, man, I love it when the puns just throw themselves together. Um, yeah. Yes, if you'd like to set yourself up on the lectern. Um, Juan Mark Alkizi will be telling us. Sean Mark. Sean <laughs> That's why I'm getting it wrong. I think it's a podium because you need to stand up. Ah, podium, not a lectern. Because ah, you have to stand up. You're not actually standing at it. Good. Um, understand the Python environment management through hiking. You ready? Let's see if we can do it. Big clap. <laughs> So, what's the problem we are trying to solve and what about hiking with Python environments? First problem we have, among many, is how many tools you can use to actually set up a Python environment and set up any project you want. So if I talk today about poetry, next week you will come to me and say, yeah, Conda does it, why use poetry? And then someone else can tell me, yeah, I can do it in Docker or just install it on your system and it will just work. And we know that every few weeks or months, we could have even yet another tool. And of course, there's an XKCD <coughs> joke about it. So we have 14 standards. Why not do one which is universal and will solve our problems? Now we have 15 of them. And that's exactly what happens with Python system. So how can we look at the problem in a way not from the tools perspective, but ask ourselves the question, what do we actually need when we have it? Maybe in a year we could have one tool which can do all, <coughs> sorry, all of it at once, but what should we ask ourselves? And let's go for a hike as an analogy. So we're going on a hike, work-life balance. You've been in COVID, eating a lot, so it's a good idea. The first thing you try to do is, let's prepare my backpack. So you get your green backpack and you have your very essential stuff, knife, uh, food, boots, hiking sticks, everything is good. You go on a hike. It was an outstanding hike. You get to this view, you just love it. And then you get another idea. Well, that's a good lake. What about canoeing? That's also a nice adventure. So you take the same backpack, you get your fishing gear, your diving gear, your swimsuit, and your apple. You try to go there, but apparently your fishing gear and your diving gear doesn't fit together in the same backpack. So you say, well, I could just buy a new backpack. It will just fit everything well. And you go on this hiking trip, it's amazing. And on this canoeing trip, it's amazing. You go into this environment and you see campers. And you so, so think to yourself, well, 
Camping is nice, so let's do the same for camping. And you get your blue backpack, it doesn't fit the book and the first aid kit. And you say, wait a second, I can use a hiking backpack. That's a good idea. But the hiking backpack doesn't fit the knife also with first aid kit, so you end up buying yet another backpack. And now you have one backpack per adventure, which is nice, but you start forgetting which one to use when and how your tools are going. So what do you do? Amazing idea. Take all your backpacks with you on every adventure. <laughs> That's the only solution, right? So you do this, and then you figure out, OK, there should be a better solution to it. And what you think to yourself is, what if I can hire someone to manage my backpacks? I have enough money. I could do it, maybe. So let's hire someone. And you should tell this person exactly what you need. And what you will tell them is all your interests, swimming, camping, canoeing, hiking, and everything you need all the tools you could possibly need, where to buy those tools, how much money you have to buy the tools, and the goal of your trips. And then you would be relaxed. Amazing, all you have to consider is actually going on the specific trip. But you're still angry because I still didn't tell you anything about Python environments, and that's the next point. So if you look at the problem that we have is having a hiking trip, you need a specific kind of backpacks to get your specific tools, your assistant will get those tools from specific shops and prepare your backpack for you for this specific adventure. Now in Python, we have a specific project and you have a specific Python environment you need with a specific version of the Python environment, which is the color of the backpack. You have the tools, which are the libraries. This assistant is actually your Python environment or package management, and the shops are repositories where you could get those tools from. Now which questions do you ask yourself in this case is, what is your trip about? Higher level questions. Which tools do you need to succeed? Who is preparing your backpack, your tools, and where do I even find those tools? So one example is a REST API serving a PyTorch model. Super easy. That's actually your adventure. Then you say, I need Fast API, I need PyTorch. Where do I get them? Fast API anywhere, PyTorch from the original repository. Those are your tools. Then you say, which backpack do I need? That's exactly Python. And then you choose 3.9.4. That's your backpack. You, you say to yourself, well, PyEnv can buy backpacks for me. So why not use PyEnv in this case? And then you say, Poetry can just manage my tools and put them in this backpack. So why not use Poetry in this case? And you end up having a fairly good environment because you ask the right questions. You could replace poetry with another tool, but as soon as, as long as you're asking the correct questions, you will choose the correct tool for the job. And hopefully you don't end up like this with so many tools and installations of Python environment that you don't even know what you're working on. So to try to solve this problem even further, just yesterday I created an empty repository, which I will post some code to it, the link to it is Python Y, because that's exactly your frustration when you look at it. And what I'm trying to do is to have some template repository where we could just all work on it, maybe have make files with poetry, Docker, everything that could possibly be what is a minimum viable product or just working. And then we can contribute that to community, ask the correct questions, and not create the 15 standard, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Right, let me look at my magic list. Jan, do we have a Jan? I didn't have a last name. There we go. Good. And please, you are the canonical Jan. Um, lovely. If you'd like to set yourself up on the podium, Jan is going to be understanding Conda in five minutes, which is ridiculous. That is a complex tool. Yes. You have let's five see, minutes. Let's see how that's going to. I can't even resolve dependencies in five minutes. <laughs> you should use Mamba. Either way, he's going to try. And that is what we that is what we encourage here at Pi Day to London. Lovely. Are you all ready? Let's see. I mean yep. there we go. Cool. Right, big clap. Awesome. I think this is a very nice transition from the previous presentation. So understanding Conda in five minutes. Let's see how it goes. Um, first question here. Who's using Conda? Please raise your hand. It's about more than half, maybe half. So I think the reason this presentation is important is because I made a friend at this, presentation, uh, at this conference, and his name is Martin. Martin, are you here? Maybe you raise your hand if you're here. 
He isn't here. Well, you should be careful who you call friends these days. <laughs> Uh, anyways, like we were talking about Conda, and uh, like he said that he tried Conda, he got confused, and he ended up using Virtual Enf and Pip instead because it just seemed more straightforward. And uh, I want to show you guys that maybe you should try Conda and also demystify it a bit from the past experience that I've had with it. So, what is Conda? Conda, much like Pip, is a package manager. Like in, in, in comparison to Pip, however, it is language agnostic. So you cannot only pi install Python packages like scikit-learn, but also C libraries like FFmpeg or JavaScript stuff like uh, Prettier. And you install all of them through the same interface, which I find personally very nice. It is also cross-platform, so you can build specific packages depending on whether your user is installing them on Linux, Windows, uh, M1, whatever. Like It doesn't matter. You can be very specific about it. It has a very sophisticated package dependency resolver. So uh, if you have a difficult environment, a complex environment with many dependencies, it figure out, figures out what are the right versions for you to use. And also, I think this is very important, it has relatively carefully curated packages, um, which means you have a better protection against like name squatting attacks or typo squatting attacks. What I mean by that is, for example, if we compare it with uh, PyP, the Python packaging index, somebody last year, uh, pushed, I think within a week or something, 3,500 empty repositories to PyP, and there's nothing uh, st like stopping you from doing that as well. And then you could technically insert malicious code into PyP, and people might install it accidentally, and bad things happen. So the next thing I want to talk about is like there's always like a lot of confusion about all these different words. Like I always hear things like I installed package packages with Anaconda, and no, you don't install them with Anaconda. But like there's a reason. Like I can understand why this is confusing. So I wanted to give a bit of like definitions here. So you might have heard of Mamba. Mamba is pretty much like Conda. It's a package manager. It's just a faster, somewhat drop-in replacement for Conda. So usually you should probably prefer Mamba over Conda. Anaconda is a company, they're selling or they're giving away free swag outside, so you should probably have heard of them. Um, they do data science and open source stuff. They are the creators of the Conda package manager, and they also maintain a Conda channel, which is basically a con container that contains Conda packages, called Anaconda, which has the same name. And since it's a bit difficult to contribute to that channel, there's also Conda Forge, which is community managed. It's a channel that any of you could technically add their packages to through a well-defined review process, and um, then everybody else would be able to use it. You can install Conda and Mamba, for example, through this link. This is what I would call the recommended approach, which installs Miniforge, which gives you Mamba and Conda Forge basically as the source for installing packages. How do you find Conda packages? Well, there's different ways of doing that. You can use the terminal. You can like type Mamba search and then the name or like some sort of pattern of what you're looking for. You can also look uh, on this website here, where I think it's here. Uh, there we go. Okay, this is working, so it doesn't matter. So there's basically a website where you can search for things and. Uh, Keep in mind that not every package that you see on PyP exists on Conda Forge, and also not all of them have the same name. For example, there's a package called DuckDB on PyP, but on Conda Forge it's called Python DuckDB, again, because Conda Forge is not specific to any language, so different names. Conda packages are essentially just compressed directories that contain files. So basically, if you look into a Conda package, it's just a bunch of stuff that when you install it, it gets copied into the right place in your uh, system. You can even build Conda packages fairly easily. It's essentially just a YAML file that contains stuff like how do you build the package and what it depends on. Like, uh, and this can be templated using a tool called Grayscale. You can even like, push very easily to Conda Forge by opening a pull request in this staged recipes um, repository, adding the YAML file you've just templated with Grayscale, pushing it, waiting for approval, merging it, and already it's there. All of these things, if you have more than five minutes, you can. <laughs> uh, like, look into these resources. All of this is actually well documented and much less magic than you might think. And I hope this was enough uh, for you to at least uh, consider giving Conda and the Conda ecosystem a try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. That was exactly as built. That was pretty good. Well done for squeezing that all in. Uh, Juan, Luis, yes, uh, you're next. So if you'd like to come up and get yourself plugged in. Uh, Juan Luis is going to talk about this is not the pandas. Oh, hello. Health and safety, trip hazards. Um, this is not the pandas logo. 
So, good. Is this the HDMI? Yes, that's the one. No, we can. Ready to go? Yep. Lovely. Big clap. <laughs> ah, pandas. <laughs> Lovely animals. A little bit clumsy, though. They do funny stuff, eat bamboo. And they give a name to a Python library. So you might have heard of this uh, little Python library called pandas that we usually import as PD. But you might not know that pandas has a logo. And this logo has been there since October 2019, which I call uh, year zero of civilization. And, but it's there. It was sponsored by Indeed. So thank you very much, Indeed, for giving us a decent logo. And when I say decent logo, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to bash anyone's uh, design skills. But every time I look at this, I think about this, <laughs> this more or less. Okay, so when you start learning pandas, you say, okay, I'm going to use my search engine of choice, which in my case is not Google, by the way, and look for some tutorials, documentation, information, and things like that. And then there's this thing creeping in, you see. <laughs> and the thing is that when you see this, you cannot unsee it anymore, and it's <laughs> everywhere. So for example, I found this other page that also has this weird pandas logo, supposedly. And I also found this other version that didn't even bother removing like the white uh, lines of the background. And this other one removed the eyes, which is super uh, crazy, I don't know. Um, sorry? It's not even a panda. And pandas are not bears, but don't spoil my talk, please. <laughs> So you see, this pandas logo keeps coming up over and over again, even though like, we're still wondering whether pandas are bears or not. Apparently, I just learned while preparing this talk that pandas comes from the Chinese word for bear. So maybe they're bears, maybe they're not. I have no idea, but clearly that was not a pandas. And so why? <laughs> why is this happening? And you see, there's this little town in southern Europe called Madrid that has this statue in the central square called El Oso y el Madroño, the bear and, I don't know, weird tree that I don't know how it's called in English. <laughs> and actually, Jake van der Plas, a very famous person in the community, noticed in 2016 that this is not the Pandas logo, it's the Python Madrid logo. And if you go to the Python Madrid website, you see very clearly that the logo is there because it's inspired in the statue. And I should know because I was the one making it <laughs> some years ago. And so you see, after all this confusion, we didn't want to add any more uh, stuff to the mix. So when I designed the PyData Madrid uh, banner, I didn't complicate myself, like adding bears or symbols or things like that, just in case it ends up in some weird place that it shouldn't be. And so now I have a proposal for you. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Juan Luis Back on Twitter. Send me the most cursed version of the fake pandas logo that you can find. And maybe come to PyData Madrid to give a talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Right, next up, Mark, Mark Madsen. There we go. There we go. There's Mark. Would you like to get yourself plugged in? Yeah. Right. Mark will be talking about PyScript and panel, or introduction to the two. Yeah. Lovely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. One. Thanks. So uh, how do I get something on the screen? It's there. There you go. Thanks. You ready? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Hi there. Thanks for taking the time. I figured out I would just uh, look at the schedule of PyDale London to see what's in it for me. So uh, I analyzed, analyzed it a bit, 
and I could see my favorite things are missing. There's nothing about data viz, data exploration, data apps, or deployment. So I, that's what I'll be talking about. So uh, please listen along. I'll be talking a little bit about my favorite uh, data app framework, which is uh, Panel, and something about PyScript, which is, which is the new thing. So we started this uh, morning with a keynote, and uh, Sylvain said something about the next 10 million users of Python would be coming from Jupyter Light. And uh, Peter Wang, he actually believes probably that uh, the next 10 million users are coming from PyScript. So uh, I guess they will be talking a little bit together. So uh, my name is Mark. I work for a company called Ørsted, and we do a lot of data exploration and data visualization and data tools. So that's why I'm interested in the topic. So uh, Ørsted uh, builds and operates wind farms. I provide analytics for traders at Ørsted. So we build a lot of apps like this uh, using Panel. And I also uh, try to share a little bit about panels. So this is my website, awesomepanel.org. I also have a sister site called awesomestreamlit.org, so uh, you might know that one as well. So uh, panel is a data frame framework. And just as the rest of Python, it runs on your laptop, it runs on servers. But if you want to share it easily, it's uh, difficult, right? You need a team of skilled experts to put it up uh, somewhere. Uh, so that's why um, PyScript is coming into the, into the picture. Also, earlier today I heard a great and inspiring talk from Tambi about Pyodide, how that actually solves security and privacy issues around data of uh, children in, uh, in UK. So there are a lot of use cases for having Python in the, in the browser. Um, so let me go back. This was uh, the schedule of Pydata. So uh, this is a panel, and I've already talked a little bit about it, that is probably the most powerful data app framework in Python. For example, we heard um, earlier, I think it was yesterday, about Dask, right? If you want to visualize big data, you use Data Shader, and Data Shader is in the same ecosystem as Panel, so it really has a, a place in there. Um, so this is just a, a simple application I built this morning, and right, then I asked my guys to put it up there on a server, and no, I did not, because this is, in fact, a PyScript powered app as well. So what I did was I went to uh, GitHub instead, right? So all uh, I did to deploy this application powered by PyScript is I went to GitHub, made a new repository, went to the settings, right? And then I went to the pages, set it up as a GitHub pages, and that's actually it, and then I have a deployment, right? So that's uh, really, really easy. I don't know how many has tried to like deploy web applications based on Python, right? It, it takes time uh, to get run up and running and, and so on. So PyScript is really uh, easy in that sense, but that's a long way because when I started out, I really wanted to make this word cloud here interactive. I wanted to be able to change the background color or maybe the fonts or whatever. But the problem here is that the word cloud package itself has C bindings. And they cannot run in the browser yet. So this is something that Python has to solve over time regarding their packages, getting them compiled to WASM. Furthermore, a lot of the packages are really, really big. So Python has to start thinking about minimizing the package size, sizes for running in the browser. Also, uh, if you think about it, you want to work with data in the browser. You cannot just do pd.read CSV. It doesn't work. So all of our infrastructure, all of our Python packages, all the way we think we have to start preparing it for the browser. So we need to say if, if, if Pyodite in sys.module, for example, then we are in the browser. And how do we want to uh, react to that and, and give um, things to our users. So what can we get, uh, especially for panel that I'm interested in? So besides deployment, we can get speed ups, and probably there's a talk about data visualization tomorrow. So one of the things we want is we want our applications to be really, really snappy. And the problem with Python, right, is it runs on a server, and then there's a front end, and you have to send data back and forth. You could not achieve like uh, speed ups like this if it was a server client-based architecture. Here we can write, get really uh, speed, up, speed ups, 
The same with like streaming applications. This uh, has been running all day and it's just streaming there um, and it's Python in the background. Um, yeah. So uh, to summarize, I've been able to, uh, yeah, this morning build a small panel app uh, deployed by PyScript and um, for me that's really, really nice. And um, if you want to connect, you can find my details at uh, awesomepanel.org. Um, so, and please come and talk if you're interested in uh, hearing more about this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Right. Alex. Um, Chev, uh, yeah, brilliant, good. <laughs> uh, lovely. And Alex, you want to get yourself plugged in? Um, Alex, we're talking about correlation at scale. Yeah. Uh, if small, yeah. Just... No. Okay. That's right. No, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Ready okay. to go? Yeah. Good. Big clap. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I want to add some algorithmics here. Uh, pretty simple. I will skip most of the slides and try to make it fast. Uh, so at Anodot, we are doing autonomous business monitoring and anomaly detection, and we are doing it at a large scale. Uh, how large? Uh, we are working with almost like half of billion of metrics, and uh, it's much more in data points. If you think about it, like one minute roll of metric is. Uh, sends at least 1,000 uh, data points daily. And uh, so having uh, two millions of uh, real-time anomalies, uh, we are reducing this number by two orders of magnitude uh, using correlation. This is the process I want to discuss with you. Uh, customers, not interesting. <laughs> uh, so I will explain in a few words how the system works. Uh, so we are running, uh, we are receiving data from the customers in multiple ways, like uh, database connections, API calls. Uh, so on for each metric we are creating um, the baseline and the deviation from the baseline is actually the anomaly. Uh, multiple anomalies uh, correlated to uh, anomaly groups and we are sending alert to the customer and receiving feedback back from the customer on the, about the anomaly quality, about the alert quality. So. Um, so here you can see like one metric, the line is number of active users for example and the shaded area is the baseline. So after a few periods of time, uh, the baseline becomes like better and better, and then after a few weeks, you can see it's almost uh, like fits perfectly the metric itself. And the second example, you can see the deviation from the norm, which is discovered as anomaly in the system. So why do we need the correlation at all? So building the uh, first of all, we want to build the root cause analysis. We don't want to analyze each metric separately, each anomaly separately, but some correlation group and understand the causality. And um, uh, probably we don't want to send all the anomalies we found to the customers because uh, it can be like tens of thousands of anomalies uh, in the system. Uh, so this is the example for the first uh, reason. Uh, we found like two separate anomalies, one anomaly about the API errors and the, another anomaly is about the uh, sales or payment success rate. Uh, so we want to understand, we want to to understand the, the reason and say, okay, the API is not working, which is why the sales drop, right? Uh, and here it's, it's in our example, like for some real customer, uh, with working with four million metrics, uh, you can have like tens of thousands of anomalies daily and uh, you don't want, you want to send just probably tens of uh, alerts uh, daily. Uh, so I want to explain about the algorithmics we are using. We are using um, a few cor correlation algorithms. One of them is the uh, graph correlation, which is pretty simple. It's more like uh, regex uh, and uh, some analysis of the data. Uh, name correlation and abnormal correlation. Uh, so the graph correlation is, as I said, is mostly regex and uh, some understanding about the data, like uh, data coming from the same data source is probably uh, correlated. If you have anomaly in the table, probably all the group bytes will be affected by the same anomaly. Uh, 
uh, right? The downside is obviously, you know, if you have a problem and trying to solve it with regex, now you have two problems, and it's exactly the way it works in production. Uh, name correlation is uh, more about uh, metadata, like we are trying, it's TFIDFish algorithm with some penalty on, uh, penalty on uh, token usage. So if the token is overused, we'll give some penalty for this token. Um, again, it works fine, but uh, you will need to, you need to have like well-defined names of metrics in your system. It's not, ex not always the case. Uh, the abnormal combination is um, more interesting um, because it actually uh, checks the um, behavior of the metric over time. So I will skip to solution. The solution is the LSH. Basically, so instead of uh, checking the actual vectors of the metrics, we are checking the signatures. And uh, this is more or less how LSH works. We just trying to find the signature for each, for each vector in the system. And once we need to find the correlated vector, we are checking only the related correlation bucket, right? Only, only the bucket having the same LSH signature in the system. Um, uh, skip, skip, skip. <laughs> Uh, so basically, this, this is the uh, this is how the again very complexity is good, better than index than index and uh, brute force, obviously about log n. Uh, yeah, the usage is interesting because at the end of the process you have some bucket of uh, signatures uh, you can check, and you are checking only the only the vectors having the same signature at least at one position and then actually checking the, uh, no, distance, the actual distance between vectors. So in this example, I'm checking only the, on the distance only for four vectors, like to find the two matching vectors. You can take it as like 100% recall with 50%, uh, um, you know. A, Maybe pipeline, uh, okay, this is like the full architecture look like. So we have some offline process for LSH and vectors calculation, the online process for grouping and actually correlation graph, and the online, uh, the online process to find all the anomalies and send it to the Kafka stream of uh, uh, online grouping. Uh, okay, I think, yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> very much. I am now looking for a Raphael. Yay, there we go. Right, so Raphael is going to talk to us about taming Python environments with Pip, Conda, and Mamba. This is the third in our series of package relevant talks. I expect you all to be experts. It might come up in the quiz. You never know. This is all useful stuff. Uh, so I... No. Yeah. There we go, that's looking good. Great. Ready to go? Yeah. Lovely, big clap everyone. Thank you. Hope you're excited to hear more about uh, Conda environments. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, such a pain that three people have to come here to talk about it. Just, uh, but so this is universal. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna show that's you, the, I'm gonna show you the solution, so listen carefully. So uh, yeah, just, just have you thinking like how much time have you spent packing your backpack, changing your backpack, and et cetera, in your life, in your career? Uh, whatever the answer is, I bet it's too much. So um, I'm gonna go through kind of my thinking, my workflow on this, so, uh, mostly using Conda and uh, Pip, and a, a bit of Mamba as well. So uh, just, I'll go over the definitions, but I think you're all experts by now. We have the traditional PIP virtual env we, uh, for scientific computing. Uh, the go-to tool is often Anaconda, which offers a curated list of packages in the Conda package manager and environment manager. And uh, there's also Mamba, which is a bit less known, but it's basically a re-implementation of Conda that's uh, much faster to run. Uh, and which one should you choose? So. Uh, looking kind of at uh, add uh, Google Trends data as a proxy for popularity, we kind of see that it doesn't seem that one technology is overtaking the other dramatically, but both kind of have found their niche and uh, do what they do and have their 
core users that like their tools, so they're not really in competition. It's more of when should you use which tool. So uh, pip virt virtual env is the de facto uh, standard for uh, Python packages. It's uh, lightweight, but reproducibility, as, I, as it was said before, is a bit difficult, and there's no dependency graph optimization. But for anything lightweight, uh, it works really well, and uh, it has worked for a long time. Then uh, Conda is, uh, it can optimize uh, dependency graphs, and it can manage like multiple versions of Python, non-Python binaries, as it was already said. But you need to kind of have the software pre-installed, so there's a bit more preparation, and sometimes it can be extremely slow. And that's basically why uh, it was, there's Mamba that was also created, which um, works much faster, but is maybe less widely adopted. So, um, how do I work um, with all these tools, which actually work pretty well together? Uh, so for anything very simple where I don't really care about uh, reproducibility or uh, I don't have a lot of dependencies, it's just pipvm, that's the go-to solution. And then uh, Conda and Mamba combination um, if I want something a bit more complicated. So the Setup, uh, you usually need to have Anaconda installed, as I said, so one simple way is to do it through Miniconda, which is lightweight, downloads very quickly. Uh, it's always good to update Conda because they do a lot of, uh, of updates and you, you can use the, the latest version. And then uh, the key to kind of combining uh, Mamba to uh, Conda is to download this Conda LibMamba solver. Uh, and it's actually the product of a, of a collaboration between the Conda people and the Mamba people to bring the uh, speed and the functionalities of the Mamba solver into uh, Conda. It's still uh, experimental, but for yeah, everything I've done up to now, I've, I didn't have any, any issues on that. There's actually a good uh, blog article uh, that's linked here uh, explaining what, what this is. And yeah, so once you have that set up, uh, you can just create your environment uh, with a Conda create and just give in all the dependencies that you're interested in having. You can also give version numbers if you want that. And you can really be crazy about it and just throw in uh, whatever you want and let uh, the Conda and Mamba server kind of figure it out. Uh, and that's where, yeah, it used to be quite slow. Uh, and with this uh, solver, LibMamba, it's much faster now. Um, and then once uh, you in created the environment, you can uh, install new Conda uh, packages. You can install additional pip packages that are gonna be installed in your library. And you can even uh, install the local, uh, your local code in an editable mode. Uh, and when you're ready to kind of share your code in your environment, you can do a conda and export and save that into the environments file, and it's gonna really put all the configurations that you need to, to reproduce it later. And uh, anybody using your code uh, or developing it can create a new environment with uh, passing this file that you've created, and then it's really a deterministic recreation with the pip, um, including the pip uh, package libraries that you added. So. It's this environment.yaml is going to be a very uh, large file with a lot of lines and all the, the, the version numbers, etc. But it's actually okay because that, that's what gives the, the reproducibility. Uh, and it's a yeah, good uh, practice to just add that to, to your project on Git so every developer can just use it. Um, yeah, just a quick notice that since uh, March 2022, uh, the Terms of services of Anaconda changed, and for commercial use, you need a license. So it's just something you should know. If it applies to you, just go see on their website or talk to the people that are uh, waiting outside. Thank you. Uh, so I'm like, happy to answer. Thank you very much, Raphael. Thank you. Right, James, you're up as our last lighting speaker. Uh, James is to talk on coherent but not consistent, which incidentally is my wife's pet name for me. There you go. So, 
she doesn't seem to like you very much. Yes! The cackle from the West. Um, Shall you tell them what's coming up right after we're done here? No, I'm going to go with that afterwards, mate. Okay. I'm looking forward to this. Okay, let's get this going on. Plug that in. Plug that in. Uh, let me try this middle one. Oh, no, yeah. It's gone. Okay, try yours. Now, James, which window management system are you currently using on your desktop? That's unfair. That's unfair. Is it a tiling window manager? Oh, it absolutely is. Let's get You're this going. You're just so neat. Well, that's why they shouldn't listen to anything I have to say. <laughs> yep, we got it. We got it. And we'll get this going. Yep. No, no, it's coming. It's coming. Just give it a second. There we go. There we go. Let's move that here. Pop that up there. Oh, there we go. There we go. You ready? Yeah. Lovely. Big clap, everyone. This is Coherent, Not Consistent. My name is James Powell. We're at Pi Data London. It's Saturday, June 18, 2022. One important note before I start this talk, I put this together in about 15 minutes. Please do not take this talk seriously. I think Pandas is a fantastic tool. It is coherent in its design, but it is not particularly consistent. One other disclaimer, do not listen to anything I have to say, because this is actually how I import Pandas in my code. I say from Pandas import data frame. I clearly have no idea what I'm doing. Now, I'll tell you what this talk is not about. This talk is not about things like in place equals true, which they're getting rid of anyway because it doesn't really do what you think it does. This talk is not about the copy equals true or false parameter that sometimes appears to actually work the way you want and tell pandas to make or not make a copy, and then other times seems to not work the way you want and actually still make a copy anyway. So copy equals false doesn't actually not copy something because if you really think about why this works the way it does, it kind of makes sense. This talk is not about why you have to reset index all the time because you probably shouldn't be resetting index all the time because that's not what pandas is about. Pandas is about index data. If you're resetting index, you're not really using pandas for what it's used for. It's also not about why the pandas documentation seems to insist that pandas is a two-dimensional data structure. It's not. The pandas documentation is wrong. A pandas data frame is like indexed one-dimensional data. You should be thinking in terms of one-dimensional data when you're using pandas, but that's not what we're here to talk about. This talk is also not about why there seem to be so many different ways to backfill stuff. Like you can B-fill, or you can backfill, or you can fill NA B-fill. Because I understand that pandas is a convenience tool, and so that's why, for example, fill NA method equals F-fill is the same thing as df.pad. I guess, you know, you need to have a lot of different ways to say things. Like, for example, you ever noticed that you have skew and kurtosis and curt? Those extra couple of letters when you're computing a kurtosis really seem to impact our work. Now, this is more about, I don't know why in the pandas API when you have a series object and you want to apply an operation to every single element, which you probably shouldn't do, but you can do anyway. You have to use .apply, but if you try that on an index, the .apply method doesn't actually exist. You have to use index.map. Why do they change the names here? It doesn't make any sense to me. Of course, you probably don't care about this next one, which is, why is it that I can set an index to set the row index, but I can't do a set index with axis equals column to move a row of this up into the column index? That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. It seems like you should be able to do both of them, because that's not consistent with set axis, which is largely doing the same thing that also takes an axis parameter. So why doesn't set index have an axis parameter? It seems like that would be the consistent operation. And also, why is it that rename axis, like set axis, has an axis parameter, but set index doesn't? And by the way, does anybody here actually remember on the first try which one they want when they want a set index, reset index, set axis, set rename axis, or you just try them in a row, and then finally you say, oh, I think the one I wanted is rename. Here's the other thing. Notice here I have to use a string, because you can't rename axis with anything that's not a string, even though you can actually name the, the elements of your index, or you can name your index itself something that's not a string, that's completely valid. But the rename axis doesn't allow you to do that. And why is it that rename axis has an index equals and a columns equals keyword argument? That doesn't seem to exist anywhere else throughout the API. I guess people, when they rename index, really want to make it shorthand, whether they're doing that on the axis or the columns. Speaking of bizarre keyword arguments, what the heck is going on with melt? var underscore name, value underscore name, that convention doesn't seem to be in use anywhere else. 
Additionally, am I the only one who seems to care about when you're trying to assign a new column into your data frame, you can assign it using keyword arguments, but, and you can even unpack a dictionary to do the same thing, but you can't pass just a dictionary so that you can have, say, columns which don't have string names? That's extremely useful, non-string named columns, and yet that's not valid. And instead, what I have to do is some contortion using join. I have to join a series that happens to be named something because it is completely valid to have a column that does not have a string name. And in fact, it's quite useful. Now, sometimes I have two data frames and I want to join them together. And please don't tell me join on something. You should join on the index. That's what it's for. But why do I have an L suffix and an R suffix parameter? That doesn't appear anywhere else in the API, especially since on merge, it's called suffixes. And why do I have this in the first place? What I really should have is multi-index columns, which, by the way, are very useful. So in fact, if I ever want to really do this, I have to do a pipe set axis combination so that I can get a data frame that has multi-index columns so I can unambiguously refer to the original columns of the original structure. And you might look at that and say, why on earth did you need those contortions in the first place? Well, part of it's because set axis, unlike anything else, doesn't take a lambda. And you can see it's not because it's ambiguous. It's just because they decided not to do that. It's just missing, even though everything else seems to take a lambda as a potential argument. So you have to use pipe. And additionally, when you have a multi-index, you can drop a level from a multi-index, but you can't add a level to a multi-index. I don't know why not. It seems like you oftentimes want to just add a level in because that's what you're doing when you're joining. You add a level to the column multi-index, and then you join them together, and then you can unambiguously refer to which column came from which of the two starting structures. And you probably don't care about any of that because you say, I don't care about pandas and the column names and the data and the modeling. I just care about my computations. I care about my data. And I care about taking a data frame and doing a df.describe. And sure, they may be getting rid of df.describe at some point. But note, why on earth is this a series with a d-type float? Because that makes the count a floating point number. What on earth does it mean to have a floating point count? You can't have 3.5 of something in a count. This should be a data frame where there's one row, and each of these are columns so that you can have the appropriate d-type on these. This is a mistake, and I guess it's maybe just a convenience. But this even affects us in our lives, because if we happen to have a data frame with three distinct values in it, and we do a very common operation, like a group by on this, you can see, oh no, I lost one of the distinct values because it upcasted through float, even those are the original integer values, and even though it looks like it's actually keeping these as integer values. Look, it used to be two, three, and four, and now it's two, four, and two. I lost data on an operation that shouldn't have lost data at all. And it's worse if I unstack it, but that kind of makes sense if I unstack it because it turns it to a NAND so that it can represent the missing data. And if I unstack and fill now, that's not going to do anything much better. But if I unstack with a fill value, it looks like it preserved these being integer values, but it didn't. It passed through float 64 anyway, so it lost my information in the first place. And if you say, well, there's not enough information available to pandas in order to do that, you should use something like pivot table, which provides enough information to the pandas API to prevent the loss of this data, well, it still loses this data because I still see there's only two distinct values here, not three distinct values. I've lost information as a consequence of an operation which shouldn't have lost information. But in the end, I kind of like pandas. It's a useful tool. It's got a coherent API. It's designed around index and index alignment operations. It's not particularly consistent. There's a lot of things that I have to memorize. And fast iteration is what helps me in this case. Because when I know that I can reorder underscore levels and I cannot remember if it's swap underscore level, no, it's not. Swap underscore levels, no, it's not. Swap level, no plural, no underscore, completely inconsistent with reorder underscore levels. It doesn't really matter because I can iterate fast enough, and the tool itself is quite useful in my work. Thank you so much. Oh, James. Oh. I kind of felt like we gave you a nice free bit of catharsis there. That felt, that felt good, right? It was good to get it out. We all love pandas. We all love pandas, you know? I mean, that's what the REPL's for, right? It's for guessing at what the method names are. Perfect. Right, well, thank you ever so much. That draws us to the conclusion of our lightning talks, but of course, brings us on to the next item of our agenda, which of course is the social. So of course, after uh, we are all finished here, we are all gonna go out into the expo area. You're very welcome uh, to go back to wherever you've come from and crash out if you've had enough for today, but if you would like to keep the party going, uh, Hopworks is sponsoring uh, our uh, social event this evening. 
so they have um, a number of branded beer, uh, which they've created. They still do not make beer, but they do have hops in the title, so I guess they felt obliged uh, to start a brewery uh, just for the conference. Uh, but yes, they are basically sponsoring it until it goes dry, in which case then you'll have to use your hard-earned dinero uh, to buy the rest of it. Uh, and then, of course, we will be having the pub quiz, which will be hosted uh, by our uh, wonderful James Powell oh, afterwards. The pub quiz, the pub quiz is don't don't use don't use this code code pub quiz um i don't know the title james what's the title of the pub quiz the pub quiz is the pub quiz what happens at the pub quiz what happens at the pub quiz well the format of pub quiz uh, should be etched in the brains of every uh, person in this room about how a pub quiz works uh, you will sit in teams and you will answer questions which are asked uh, the questions are designed uh, to make you feel like an idiot uh, it's important <laughs> We know a lot of you in this room have obviously been doing software and data science for a long time, and it's quite right you were taken down a peg. Uh, we're going to ask you questions which, quite frankly, no one should be asking, but you are going to be expected to answer. Uh, a good score at the pub quiz, just because in case you are used to getting 100% on your tests, or have been for the, your whole life, uh, is probably about 30%. If you get anything above 30%, you're cheating. Um, <laughs> And I should also, I mean, uh, the, the general tip is that a lot of things do focus on the non-focus packages. So I do invite you uh, to uh, revise the board outside of all the fiscally sponsored projects at the non-focus sponsor. Uh, is there a prize? Is there a, that's a good point. What is the prize? I think they'll give a free ticket next year, but also you know you're the best. Yeah, right. So, of course, bragging rights and eternal glory, which, of course, is the most important thing. Uh, but we will also be giving away a free ticket, a free, three-day ticket to the conference next year. So, of course, yeah, there we go. That is a serious prize uh, for you all. Um, yes, and I believe we're at the end of that. Thank you ever so much for your participation uh, in the uh, talk part of uh, the conference. Um, please do join us at the social. Uh, and if you don't, uh, then we'll see you all tomorrow for the second day. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>